Well, bright good morning to everybody, and welcome to Plant and Pathogens. Um, got a great program lined up for you, and we're eager to get started. If you haven't already typed your name into the chat box with your county and the number of people that are at your site, please do that. That helps us to document how many people are participating in the program. That's great information for the presenters and speakers as well as the clinic and me and all of us. So thanks for making time to do that. Please don't uh, turn your microphone on unless you're actually speaking. That will cut down on feedback and um, be a lot smoother. Looks like there's a lot of traffic on Collaborate today. I'm noticing that um, the reception has slowed down for, for a couple people right now, and that comes on and off as, as, the, um, as it gets overloaded. So what that will do is make it it's such that sometimes it will be going kind of fast to catch up. It'll sound like Minnie Mouse, and sometimes it will be, be slower, but um, it's doing the best it can, so, so thanks. Agents, thank you for registering on LMS to get continuing ed credit and for recording your attendance on our, our spreadsheet. I am indeed Lucy Bradley, the Extension Specialist with Urban Horticulture here at NC State and the Extension Master Gardener State Coordinator. Delighted to be with you this morning. We have Lee J. Temple back from maternity leave, and we're so glad that Lee J. is here. And this is the amazing Emma Grace. Welcome, Lee J. Good morning, everyone. I just love seeing pictures of my little sugar puss. That's what I call her. <laughs> I don't call her Emma Grace. I call her sugar puss. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to love that. <laughs> Um, whoops. All right, that's here we go. So for those of you who, have, who haven't used uh, Blackboard Collaborate, um, there are just a couple of things you need to know. Um, do not talk unless uh, you have something to say, and we would like for you to raise your hand if at all possible. Um, the talk area is in the upper left, and raising your hand is right under um, that area. It's the one that looks like a hand. Um, below that, we have a list of all of our participants. And um, at the bottom left, we have the chat area. So you can type into the chat window if you have a question for one of our speakers or uh, have a question uh, from me. And uh, we ask that you um, don't uh, have personal conversations in the chat area just because uh, it's hard for us to moderate and pull out the questions that we want to um, have asked of our speakers. Uh, the main area is um, right here. And this is called our whiteboard. Um, if you want to check your audio at any point, you can check the audio setup wizard. And one thing I'd like for you to do um, before we get started is let us know where you're coming from. So in the toolbar on the left of the whiteboard, click on the one that looks like a starburst and click on the map to show us where you're listening from. All right, I'm going to give it back to Lucy. And make sure you have your microphone on, Lucy. Oh, thank you so much. Um, we have a website for plants, pests, and pathogens where you can get all the information that you, you need. There's a tiny URL. Um, right here, this just makes it short, easier for you to to copy down, but it's got a schedule of all the upcoming speakers and talks. This is the place that you can go to get to log into um, copies of past presentations. There's uh, 
a directory of the topics that have been, been covered in past topics, so you can, can get all of that right here. It's also where you can go to get information about uh, Collaborate and anything else you need to know about plant tests and pathogens. We have a great program today. Our future speaker is Dr. Mark Wyndham. Um, we'll have Showstopper Plants with Mark Blevins and Current Issues in Insects and Diseases with Matt and Mike. Delighted that Dr. Wyndham is here with us. He's one of our own, a graduate of NC State, now the department head for entomology and plant pathology at the University of Tennessee. He's won lots of awards for his teaching and his publications. His passion is dogwood, but, but he's also very interested in roses, and that's what we've asked him to focus on today, managing diseases in roses. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm delighted. Well, is it time to get started? I guess we're going to get started. We're going to be talking about diseases of roses. We're going to get into it uh, very quickly. If you have any questions, all you do is just put it into the chat. I will be watching that. Uh, we're going to start off also very quickly. I sent Dr. Shu two handouts. Uh, one is uh, homeowner versions of commercial uh, fungicides. Uh, we don't recommend anything here for homeowners that is, does not have a homeowner label. And the other one is a list of roses that are resistant to foliar leaf spots, or at least uh, across the state of Tennessee, and I suspect it would be true for most of North Carolina as well. But uh, we're going to get started. The first one we want to talk about is powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is a disease of roses that is very, very easy to recognize because of the white powder leaf fungal growth on the leaves. The leaves may be distorted. Uh, they may have blister-like areas on the upper leaf surface. They can twist. The buds can be distorted and twist around as well. And uh, this particular picture shows some leaves that are blister-like. You can see the white mycelium on both the buds and on the leaves. Now the fungus is going to overwinter on the stems and the leaves. The spores of the fungus require extremely high humidity to germinate, but free moisture will inhibit germination. And you say, well, all we have to do is leave the leaves wet. Well, that will help with powdery mildew, but it's going to make some other diseases very, very very, very uh, uh, difficult to control. Uh, what I recommend doing, uh, homeowners should or landscapers should be destroying infected materials, and that includes leaves that have dropped onto the ground. Uh, I recommend trying to prune out and destroy any foliage and promote good air movement. Uh, if we can, and the way we do that is by proper pruning. And there's a lot of YouTube uh, videos on how to prune roses properly. And the bottom, the bottom line is we want an open center. We want all the foliage growing to the outside, like in a vase type shape. And if you do this, it will keep the humidity down in the center of the bush, which is where powdery mildew starts, usually starts to grow. Resistance is available. Uh, any of the plants that's on the resistant uh, uh, on the resistant list would be resistant to powdery mildew. Uh, dormant oils can be useful in the winter. Fungicides are useful as preventatives. Uh, there are systemics labeled even for homeowners once the disease is detected, but it's been my opinion they don't work very well after the disease begins. So. If the old adage, prevention, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, in a case for black spot or powdery mildew, I would say a metric ton of, pre of uh, prevention is, uh, I mean, a, a milligram of prevention is worth a metric ton of cure. So we don't want this thing to get started if we can help it. Now, another disease is black spot. Another disease is black spot uh, uh, is black spot, and uh, what you want to look at, if you look at that leaf, I want you to notice how the spots 
or the spots are um, are uh, very much um, diffusing out into the leaf. There's not a definite border. Sort of reminds me of apple scab. The leaves will turn yellow and fall off. There can be purple to red raised lesions. You'll see a picture in a few minutes of black spot on a, on a stem or on a cane. Uh, it may be very insignificant in appearance on that cane, but it can have very big impact on the foliage uh, in the next season. So we watch for that and we'll be pruning it out. Now, leaf wetness enhances infection. The canidia are spread by splashing water, people, and insects. The fungus can overwinter on fallen leaves and on stems. So that's why we have to watch for it on stems. This is just a little cartoon that shows that a canidium and a two-celled, they have to be wet for six to seven hours. Usually nine to 18 hours uh, is optimum. You would think, well, when is that going to happen? Well, during the night when dew forms, especially on plants that are on the north side of a house or on, at higher elevations, uh, the, the dew can stay on them for quite a while. 100% humidity is not enough. We need free water. Now, this can help us. Knowing that, uh, we need to know, you need to know when dew and gutation, that's natural water drops that come out on the leaf at night, when that is going to occur. And what you want to do is not extend that area, that time of leaf wetness. So if the dew where you are it forms around 10 p.m. and it's not, the foliage isn't going to be dry to 10 a.m. the next morning, we don't want to be watering uh, four hours on either side of that window. So uh, what I recommend for rosarians to do, uh, they have drip irrigation, they're using soaker hoses, is to put it on a timer to come on when the dew is forming on the leaves. That way we're not extending the, the, uh, not extending the uh, wetness period of the leaves any more than we have to. Resistance is very, is very, I mean, we know about knockout roses, but it's not just knockout. This is a picture of a My Girl in one of our test plots next to a susceptible peace rose. And this is at the end of the season, and you can see that there is a profound difference. Now, there are different races of the fungus. This can have an effect, but the uh, roses that are on that handout that I gave uh, have been subjected to 11 races of, of, uh, of the fungus that causes black spot, carpon, and so uh, uh, you don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, environment, though, can affect resistance. If the roses are in the shade, roses are sun-loving plants, but if you stress them by putting them in the shade, all bets are off, and that includes knockout roses as well. Warning, not every rose that has knockout in the name is resistant to black spot or powdery mildew. Susceptible knockouts include rainbow knockout, sunny knockout, the new white knockout. None of those things are resistant. I really wish they didn't have knockout in their name. Uh, keep the leaves dry as much as possible. Promote good air movement by opening up the center of that bush. Use sanitation, get rid of defoliated leaves, and if it's a rose that's susceptible, you're going to have to use fungicide sprays, preferably once a week from when foliage begins, probably in March to April where you are at, all the way up to the second killing frost if you want to keep the, the, roses, the rose foliage looking really, really good. So if, if you're clients are not interested in that type of fungicidal spray, and goodness knows each year fewer people are, well, then you're going to have to deal with resistance. Uh, once again, encourage homeowners to use fungicides that are only label for homeowner use. Rosarians are notorious of wanting to buy commercial uh, formulations off the web. Uh, obviously, don't have them keep using the same fungicide all year long. You want to rotate with fungicides that don't have the same mode of action. The handout will help you with that. 
uh, encourage homeowners to use paint aerosol -sol respirators and nitrile gloves. And of course, avoid spraying the foliage when it's wet or during the heat of the day. It's not so much the fungicides that may burn the foliage, but some of the carriers that the fungicides are in may be oil-based, and that may uh, burn the foliage if they're spraying in the heat of the day. Uh, another disease that we deal with usually in the spring is downy mildew. The leaves may turn red, brown, purple. The spots can be irregular. They may be the spots may be bordered by veins that makes them look angular. Uh, a common symptom is that the foliage will defoliate. I've seen roses in poly houses uh, in the spring waiting for it to warm up so that they can uh, have people come in and buy them to defoliate in three days after symptoms begin to show. So this is something you have to watch for. Uh, I definitely recommend that we're going to use uh, preventative fungicides. And this is what I'm uh, in a poly house. If you have anybody dealing with roses in a poly house, uh, lack of humidity control can spell disaster with downy mildew. I had a grower in Knoxville lose 14,000 roses in less than a week. And what we recommend if there is a fan, if there's not a fan, put one in there, get the doors open uh, late in the afternoon, evacuate the air that's in there, and get some drier air in to go into the evening hours when it cools off. Uh, it can overwinter as dormant mycelia, that's just a fungus uh, on the plants, or it can also overwinter as old spores, which is a resting spore. Uh, downy mildew is going to happen when it's cool and wet. Usually in Tennessee, by the time the daytime temperatures get up to uh, consistently around 80 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, uh, the downy mildew may be on the foliage, but it basically just sits there at that point. But it has not gone away. And it will be there the next year if you don't come in with some sanitation. Uh, so we're going to destroy all the infected materials. And fungicides, if it's commercial, recommend Aliette. Uh, homeowners, the only thing we really got is Mancazel. Now, it's really important that you use a formulation that has zinc. Uh, if it doesn't have zinc, like Man uh, Mancazel does, and it's just manzate, it's not going to work. So really what we're after here is the zinc. I tried copper, has not worked as well. You really need to have the zinc in there. And it does give uh, amazingly good control for homeowners, and, and, and it's really the only thing we've got. Uh, up around Boone, if there's anyone in that area where it's cool, uh, they may have infracnose. Now, when it says not common in Tenarchy, that's Tennessee, Arkansas, and Kentucky. That's a district of the American Rose Society, but this would be true also for North Carolina, but uh, Virginia has, and West Virginia have problems with anthracnose. It's possible up in the mountain areas, but this may be a problem. It can be confused with black spot, but I want you to look at those lesions. They have a definite border around them. The center of them is tan. There's little black specks, which are the fruiting bodies in them. If you're looking hard, you can tell the difference between them. It's also a cool weather disease. So most of us are not going to uh, see this. But if you do, the controls are similar as for black spot. So it may not be black spot, but you can certainly control it by pretending like it is. Another disease that we're finding to be rampant, especially on shrub roses in the middle of summer, is the cosper leaf spot. It can cause the leaves to turn yellow. The plants can defoliate just like black spot. It's favored by hot, humid weather. It's controlled by the same fungicides for black spot. Many shrub roses that are resistant to black spot are very susceptible to Cicospor leaf spot. Uh, the handout that you have, the roses that are on it, was screened for this disease as well as black spot. Uh, 
if you have a very, very hot summer, there's a moderately resistant rose on that list, carefree sunshine, it may spot up with Cicospora. But it will retain its foliage and bloom fine, so it will be moderately resistant in some locations and will be uh, tolerant in others. Diseases of the, of the blooms and of the flower buds, one of the most common is Botrytis blight. Botrytis blight is a reason why I never recommend companion plants in a rose bed. I have some rosarians would like to plant geraniums in, their, uh, in front of their roses. Not a good idea. This is a way that botrytis can be brought in. It will start off as small pinkish lesions. The buds may droop. The flowers and the buds may even turn black. It's favored by cool, rainy weather. The more rain, the better. One of the things, though, about botrytis is but it tells me, though, that the people have not been good at deadheading their bushes. This can be a big problem in greenhouses, so good ventilation is a must. Fungicides may be useful for preventative things, but you have to realize that botrytis can develop resistance to fungicides very quickly. <coughs> now, the picture of the rose that you see here, look at the foliage you'll see some powdery mildew on that foliage as well. Often these two in a greenhouse go together, and what that tells me is, is that the ventilation is not what it should be. So that is something that you can watch for. Another problem that we have is ghost spots or petal spots. There's a lot of different fungi that can cause this. We think it's associated with rainfall. Uh, years ago in Knoxville, uh, the spring rose show was almost devastated because we didn't seem to have a sunny day. It seemed to be raining every single day leading for three weeks leading up to the show. And the roses that came into the rose show were covered in petal spots, except for one man. Uh, the late Clyde Chapel, he was an animal scientist here. His roses were absolutely beautiful. What I found out from him after the show, when I went by his office, he had gone by a local Kentucky Fried Chicken and bought a bunch of those paper, I mean, uh, barrels or containers that you get like a 16-piece dinner in, and he had put those on tomato sticks over his blooms like little umbrellas, and he had no petal spot. So rainfall definitely does have something to do with it. Fungicides have not proven effective for petal spots, especially when we need them when it's raining almost every day. So this thing is difficult to control. About the only thing that I have found to be somewhat useful is that if you see it developing on some, bu some buds, even before the blooms open, prune them out. Get rid of them. Try to reduce that inoculum as much as you, as you can. Another disease that's very difficult to control is brown canker. <coughs> now, brown canker is going to start as small red purple spots. It's going to look like a little black spot lesion on the cane, but it's going to enlarge to one to three inches in length. I've seen these things as much as six to eight inches in length. They often turn a whitish brown. The cane will wilt, and this canker is definitely active during the winter months. So what will happen is the cankers, you know, a lot of your homeowners will not be out there looking at their roses a lot during the winter, but they need to be looking for brown canker, because this is when it's active, and this is when the cankers start to enlarge. And we want to use very sharp pruners all the time when we're doing our pruning. That seems to help. We want to prune out cankers as soon as detected. That means you've got to be watching during the winter months. The rose cane will die back with the canker. It seems to be delimited by a node. But we need to make that cut just above that node, so we want to cut, cut it out early. 
I have not tried any fungicides myself, but I know people that have tested fungicides for for brown canker and nothing has proven to be useful. So really all we can do is catch it early and get rid, rid of it. It definitely, as you can see in the picture, will sporulate on the canker. So we just want to get rid of it when it's small and before it starts to sporulate would be optimum. Okay, uh, another thing that you, uh, that you might see that you may have some people see is rose rust. This is a serious problem in the western United States. In North Carolina, it's not going usually will not over winter, uh, but what will happen is people will get in some new roses, and there may be some pustules on the canes or small pustules on the foliage that they didn't notice. This is especially a problem on mail order roses. And so you have to watch for it. Now what it will do is it will spread to every other rose in the garden that year. The roses will defoliate. They will have nothing left but stems. So if you see it uh, in a garden, a client calls you about it and you diagnose it as rust, you need to tell them sanitation, get rid of anything showing rust, and you need to come in with a fungicide that's good for rust. Uh, for homeowners, that's probably going to be a triazole type product. Uh, you can use something like the Bayer systemic fungicide, the fer which is tebiconazole, or the Fertilone systemic fungicide, which is propiconazole, something along that line. And it's after sanitation has been done. You do sanitation very quickly, and then you get the fungicide on to protect anything that's not showing that's not showing uh, signs of the fungus. Let me get back up here, move my pointer. <coughs> so what I tell all people, when you get new plants in and they leaf out, you need to or if you buy a plant that has you go to buy a plant, you inspect the foliage. Don't bring rust home. If you happen to bring it home, get rid of it and then spray. It's real important that you be uh, that, that they be very observant and that they be proactive. Another disease that can be very difficult to control is crown gall. Usually on roses where we see this is right at the soil line or below the soil line. Now I've seen roses tolerate very large galls. And I've seen cultivars of roses get a gall the size of a marble and the whole plant dies. So rose cultivars are very, very variable in their ability to tolerate crown gall. The galls may darken with age and they, they may harden up. Uh, I call them woody because they're hard, but, uh, but, but uh, they're really all just made of parenchyma type tissue. Uh, galls can be high on stems if uh, you haven't sanitized the pruners. Uh, so uh, we definitely recommend sanitizing pruners, uh, Lysol sprays, uh, alcohol wipes, things of this type are good. Try to avoid Clorox because Clorox is very corrosive to the edge uh, of the pruner. Uh, another problem with crown gall, or at least with the bacterium, agrobacterium tumor facens, is that it's a soil inhabitant. So if you want to go back in to the same place with another rose bush, you need to remove at least two bushels of soil before replanting in the same place. Because the bacterium can persist in the soil indefinitely. So uh, this is one of those things, you remove the infected plant, you've got to remove the infested soil along with it, or you're, you're just not going to be doing any, any good at all. I do not know of any rose cultivars that have any resistance to crown gall. So you can assume that any rose that you would go back in the hole with is going to have this disease as well. 
uh, there are a number of viruses uh, that affect roses. Uh, there's been some problems with uh, with uh, ring spot viruses uh, this spring on some roses in Tennessee. But most commonly what we see is rose mosaic. Now rose mosaic virus is actually a name for a number of other viruses that are all viruses that come from apples. It's been theorized that back at, in the early 1900s when they were looking for a rootstock to grow roses in sandy soils that they tried grafting roses onto apple rootstock. You can do that. But when they did that, they introduced a number of apple viruses into roses. And then propagation from those roses happened. And the next thing we know, we had rose mosaic in a lot of roses. It does not spread from run one rose to another. It cannot be spread by insects. It's only spread through propagation. So what this means is inspect foliage before buying bushes. Now, the effect that rose mosaic may have on a bush may be very subtle. But I tell homeowners here that if they buy a rose and rose mosaic symptoms appear, while that rose is under its guarantee period, take it back and get another rose, even if it's a different cultivar, that does not have the virus. This also sends a message to both retail garden centers and the wholesalers that this thing shouldn't be to tolerated since it is spread. Now there are some cultivars that if a client insists on having them, that it's hard to get one that's not infected. Fragrant Cloud is one of those roses. Weeks Roses claims there's no such thing as a rose that doesn't have it. I'm not sure I believe that. But there is no doubt that most fragrant clouds roses are going to have rose mosaic virus. One that, a virus that is really affecting roses in the uh, Mid-South right now is rose rosette. And we now know from some work done at the University of Arkansas that this truly is a virus. It's a virus that's hard to work with. It's hard to do research with. And this one's going to be a tough nut, nut to crack. Uh, symptoms of rose rosette, initial symptoms may be one shoot that has unusual thorniness. Uh, the leaves, like in section A there, may be strapped. And by that I mean they may be elongated, very thin. Uh, they can uh, be distorted in other ways. Uh, usually that shoot will turn into a witch's broom that will be a profusion of distorted red shoots and blooms that are all coming from one cane. In picture B, all of that is coming off of one cane in that bush. And it's, that one cane is about to overcome the entire pink, pink knockout that you see there. Uh, you may have clusters of distorted flowers. But one thing is for certain, uh, this virus is going to kill that plant in two to five years. Uh, and what you see in D is a plant that has been killed by uh, rose rosette. And at the top of that bush, you can still see what's left of that witch's broom that was up there. Um, some uh, rose cultivars tolerate the, uh, the virus longer than others, but death is certain for, for all of them in the end. So this particular virus, unlike rose mosaic or tobacco ring spot that, that might get on some, uh, this thing is definitely lethal. Now where can it hide? Rose rosette can hide in a lot of places. One of the most common places that it can hide is in multiflora rose. Uh, a few weeks ago at a rose rosette summit in Delaware, I learned that a number of states in the east, in the east during the Depression and even during World War II were being paid to plant multiflora rose for, for, soil, for control of soil erosion. Uh, the state of West Virginia planted 20 million uh, 
plant, uh, plants uh, multiflora rose during that time. North Carolina planted 14 million throughout the state. And so uh, uh, we certainly spread it around. Of course, the pioneers brought it in, or people coming in from Europe brought it in as an ornamental as well. What we do know is, is that one mature multiflora rose bush can produce 500 million seed, excuse me, 500,000, excuse me, 500,000 seed a year. Those seed can persist on the soil for at least 40 years. So the virus will come in, kill the plant. You may destroy the plant with a herbicide. Uh, but then what happens is all the seed come back. And, uh, and so many of those seed, and then you'll have a thicker thing, a multiflora rose. If those things start to produce seed, well, now you've got enough seed for another 40 years. So multiflora rose is very, very difficult to control. And this is where the virus can hide. It's spread by an aerified mite. The mite is the size of a dust particle. It does not have wings. It just blows in the air like dust. And it can be hiding in unexpected places. I found rose rosette in retail garden centers. I found it in wholesale nurseries. I found it in plant swaps and giveaways. Of course, I found it in large commercial plantings as well. The mite is going to hide underneath uh, the leaf sheath, and uh, sometimes they'll come out. If you look in that bottom picture where the yellow, at the end of the year, yellow arrows, this is under high power with a stereoscope. There are aerified mites there after I peeled the leaf off where the leaf sheath, sheath would be, uh, or, or Baldo did. And I've done this my own. This is how we count them now in our, in our research. And this is where we find them. So they hide. They're really, really hard to find. And they're hard to get a miticide at as well. So how is it controlled? Right now, the only thing that we know that works is to remove and destroy the bush when the symptoms are first observed. There's no proof that miticides will limit the spread of the virus. We're testing a number of miticides right now. You'll see a lot of stuff on the web about use of miticides, but I cannot tell you that they work. There are no roses known, uh, cultivars known, to be resistant to the mite or the virus. There are some species roses that may have resistance, but none of them are common in the trade. And cultural control measures such as pruning or barriers that's being tested but none of that uh, has been, uh, to date, has been proven to work. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop, and I went through this hurriedly because I'm interested in hearing your comments. So if you, are, if you are capable of talking, I'm going to stop my talk button for a minute. And if any of you have any comments or questions, or if you just want to type it in and chat, I'm going to stop because you've been very polite. I've been watching the chat, haven't seen much activity there. I'm sure that if you're on the west side of the mountains, when the sun is going down, the mountains are a deep red, and it's North Carolina state country. But when you come on my side of the mountains, the mountains in the morning are orange, and it's definitely big orange country. So with that, I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn my talk off for a second, and I, I really would like to hear from you. This is intentional because this is how I learn. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I want you, I'm researching teaching. I have great respect for what you do. County agents are the front porch of the university. You are the, what most people see when they think of NC State or the University of Tennessee. Uh, you are the person that's Johnny on the spot, and the reputation of the university depends on a, a lot based on what you do. And uh, we are very grateful for you, and there's no doubt that you probably have the most important job in the entire university. So I've hushed. I've turned off my button. And Bart, there are uh, two questions down in the chat. How should the bush be destroyed? 
And then any benefits to baking soda, kelp sprays, vermicompost, sprays on fungal infections? Those are two good questions. Let's deal with the baking soda question first. There's a lot of stuff on the web about baking soda. Uh, it's used a lot in the Midwest and in the Northeast and in the Pacific Northwest. People tout it all the time as a green, biorational type thing. I was very anxious to use it for black spot control here in Knoxville. We tried it three years. I can put it simply this way. Uh, you would be better off stripping naked and dancing around the bush shaking a gourd and making some type of incantation than using black spot for con than using it for control of black spot uh, in the Raleigh area. It because Raleigh is going to be equivalent to Knoxville or Nashville. We tried it in both places. It does not work. Why does black spot not work here? Our pressure is too high. Dr. Keith Zeri, who was Vice President of Research for Jackson Perkin Roses, was going through some of my uh, resistance trials, and he became very angry because Good and Plenty had black spot on it. That's a cultivar. That was a Jackson Perkins Rose. And I said, so? He says, well, on Long Island with Marjorie Daltrey, and then at Ohio State, and at the Missouri Botanical Gardens in St. Louis, it all it was resistant to black spot, but it's ate up here. And I said, they're north of the baking soda line. If you get where the environment is not real conducive for black spot, where they don't have the prolonged periods of heat and humidity that we do in the mid-south and in the deep south, baking soda will work. But it will not work down here. Now, the questions about, uh, about uh, Rose rosette. You can compost rose rosette bushes if they are not close to your roses. Dr. Jim Arwine at the University of West Virginia, he's now retired. He is the only aerified mite expert that I'm aware of left in the United States, and he's in his mid-70s. God help us when he's gone. Uh, he tells me that the mites will fall off and die after that bush has been dug up for four or five days. But in that period of time, they are capable of being blown in the wind. So that means that the, uh, the uh, compost pile needs to be way out of sight of any roses uh, that there might be an issue with. Uh, Lucy, are there any other questions? I don't see any in the um, chat box. Any of you guys want to, to ask a question? I see a hand raised here, a hand raised. I see that, that there's a couple people who are typing. Um, so are there any organic options for fungicides? Any organic options for fungicides? Uh, I have tried neem oil for uh, control of powdery mildew. That worked really well. Uh, some organic people might, who will tolerate some spottings, might think that it works for black spot. Rosarians would say that it would not. Uh, I haven't found a lot of organic options for, for, for black spot at all. That's very unfortunate. Uh, what I tell people is that if they want to try to reduce the use of fungicides, they've got to be very aggressive with sanitation. They've got to be very aggressive with getting good air movement around the bushes. That means they may want to spread the bushes out more. And so that they don't come in contact, you've got good air movement in the middle, you've got good air movement in between. Uh, doing things like this will definitely reduce your pressure, a uh, black spot, and that may be as good as we can go. What else? 
Yeah, Mark, this is Mike Munster. I had a question from an agent a while back, and that was basically whether or not milk is effective as a black spot control. And I had found absolutely no evidence of research being done on that. What do you know about milk? Well, of course, Mike, we know from when we were in graduate school in North Carolina State, we saw those pictures of milk for controlling TMV when you were transplanting tobacco. And uh, but I have seen, I have not tried it myself. I have not seen any anything at all of use of milk for control of black spot. I uh, think it would leave a fairly stinky residue on the leaves, and I'm not sure how people would feel about that. <laughs> but uh, I, I have no idea. All right, thanks, Mike. I know there's been studies with milk and different milk products and skim versus whole and raw versus pasteurized and so on for powdery mildew. And there, some places um, there seem to be some promise to it, but a lot of those studies were done in the greenhouse and it may just not apply to the field, although a few things were done in the field too. But I saw nothing about black spot. Yeah, I, I saw that about mildew. My, my first thing would be you're gonna to have to add a spreader sticker to that. How are you gonna keep the milk from washing off as soon as you as soon as you have the first one rain? I'm not so sure milk wouldn't wash off with a dew. I just don't know. I I, I haven't tried it. Anyone else? This is the quietest bunch of county agents I've ever seen. If there isn't anything else, I do want to make a couple of comments. If you have a question later, um, the resistance handout has my email address on it. Uh, you can email me at any time. I'm I usually I'm not real good with phone calls, but I'm really good with email. But I will warn you, next week I'm going to be at the beach. And I will not be checking email next week. If I did, my wife would skin me alive. I, I would love to, but she won't allow it. So, uh, but after next week, I'll be back. If you have a question, you are welcome. Well, Mark, thank you very much for an outstanding presentation. I, I think that's part of why there weren't so many quest questions, is because you were so well organized and covered it co so comprehensively. We really appreciate your joining us this morning and braving the technology to to share. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching NC State in the College World Series. My goal was for them to make it to the finals. My other alma mater, Mississippi State's in the finals, but they took it on the chin last night. But if you can bear to do it, pull for the Bulldogs tonight. Y'all have a great, <laughs> great day, and thank you very much. Hey, Lee J, why am I getting uh, blank pages? What do you mean, Lucy? I'm seeing uh, uh, the showstoppers page. OK, on my screen, it's, it's white. Very oh, interesting. It's I have a complete blank um, whiteboard. OK, and Peggy Tate says hers is blank, too. Barbara says she can see it. Peggy it can me, let me see. Um, it looks Not like blank. It, I guess I'm the only one who yeah, can see it. It looks like it's having a Thanks. hard time loading for some people. OK, I'm one of those people. So since, it, so it's the screen for the um, showstoppers? Yes, and it okay. has the, the two pictures for Shoal Creek. Fantastic. Uh, Mark Blevins is going to be talking with us about showstoppers. So Mark. Welcome. I see that Mark is still away. Uh, maybe we'll skip the showstoppers and come back. And I'm wondering, um, Barbara or um, Mike or Matt, would you be willing to MC? Because I can't, I can't see. Oh, 
see I I have the text that says that this is this is Matt. So um, welcome, Matt. With, um, thank you for covering current entomology for us. Hello. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you great. Great. Okay. Well, um, today I'm going to talk about more insects. Um, and last time I didn't get to talk about one of my favorite groups, uh, lice. But I'm not going to talk about the lice that are pictured here, book lice that you find in homes or in your pantry, things like that, or the, the dreaded parasitic lice like head lice and some of the uh, unmentionable lice. I am going to be talking about bark lice. So um, this is a group that doesn't get a lot of attention normally, but they're extremely common in the environment, uh, sometimes in homes, but all, uh, all over the place. We actually have about 1,200 species in the U.S. in 43 families. And they're actually fairly difficult to identify. Uh, you need to look at them under the microscope. But as a group, they're actually fairly easy to identify. Uh, they're small to tiny insects, um, most less than a quarter of an inch. Uh, and you'll see them basically crawling around outside on walls, tree trunks, and on leaves. Um, and the best way to identify them is that they kind of look like they have um, an aphid wing venation, and they hold their, their wings tent-like, kind of at an angle uh, down the body. Uh, but the best thing to look for is a large eyes and a bulging face, uh, which you'll see in some of the later photos. Uh, those are all good characters to look at for determining whether you have bark louse. Uh, now, I want to mention them because they're commonly sent in, and we get pictures of them a lot, uh, because they're sometimes obvious and on plants, but they're not considered pests. Now, the book lice and certain other pests, and obviously the parasitic lice, are considered pests. Uh, but these typical bark lice, the ones with the large wings and they're outside, um, are not considered pests. They're going to be feeding on spores, pollen, algae, uh, lichens things like that. In fact, the other day in the clinic, Chuck Hodges was observing some fungi, some spores of fungi on a, on a twig, and saw a bark louse eating them and defecating. And he actually even looked at the frass, the feces, and found only spores in it. So um, they're basically grazers. They're kind of Dave Steffen liken them to lawnmowers. They basically go around the surface of things and eat things that are on there, organic matter. Um, these, uh, these are ones that you commonly see on camellias. I found these on some camellia underneath the leaves. And uh, here's an adult uh, with the wings. And the, here are her nymphs that stick together. And it's hard to see, but there's actually silk, a silk covering over them. Uh, so actually, a lot of the silk that you find on plants can be attributed to bark lice. Um, it's similar to spider mite silk, but finer and uh, much less dense, and uh, similar to, to spider silk as well. But you'll find these bark lice associated with the silk. Uh, and a few of them are subsocial, which means they'll congregate and aggregate as uh, different individuals, not necessarily uh, um, closely related individuals. Uh, but you'll find them usually in groups. And actually, the most commonly kind of uh, questioned or sent in one is uh, this large bark louse, Ceratosochus venosus. Um, and these congregate on, the, on tree uh, trunks, and they're fairly large. The actual, the adult is, uh, is about, I'd say, 7 millimeters or so, almost a centimeter long. Uh, and these are the nymphs, these bright yellow and black striped uh, babies will congregate and kind of, uh, I'm not sure why exactly, but it's probably to gain protection. And sometimes you even see the adults, the white winged ones, hanging out with them. Uh, but again, nothing to be afraid of. These are not going to be hurting your trees. They're basically going to be eating, especially on trees with lots of algae and stuff on them, they're going to be eating that. Um, so again, if you see these, don't worry. They're not destroying your trees. They're just hanging out. And uh, they're very common in the landscape, like I said. OK, so um, on from bark lice, 
one of the things I'd like to talk to you today about is the hibiscus sawfly, and then talk a little bit more about sawflies in general. So the hibiscus sawfly is a type of wasp, a primitive wasp. that are all called sawflies. And this is the family Argidae. Um, and this species, Adamacera decepta, they feed on various mallows um, in the family Malvaceae. This can include cotton and things like that, but it's not really their main host, and they're not, they don't really prefer it. Uh, but they do highly prefer hibiscus, except for the large woody shrubs. Uh, so mostly the herbaceous hibiscus, uh, hibiscus and uh, not things like Rosa sinensis or Syriacus. Now, um, the larvae are caterpillar-like. You can see one right here, long green with several black studs on, the, on each segment. Um, and the larvae feed on the undersides of the leaves until it's skeletonized. And after they're done feeding, they're going to go down and pupate near the soil in little silk cocoons, kind of brown papery silk cocoons. Uh, just to note, here is actually an imposter. It looks similar to the adults, but you can see there's a different color on the thorax. This is probably a parasitic wasp that might be parasitizing them. Uh, but I didn't get the actual specimen, so I wasn't able to identify it. Uh, and these photos were taken in my yard uh, a couple years ago. Now, the damage, the extensive feeding damage when this happens looks like this. Uh, so you've got these larvae that look like caterpillars feeding on the undersides of the hibiscus. So control options are as follows. You can scout for the adults on plants um, by looking for the adults and the scars that they leave in the sides of leaves. Uh, they'll basically, they're called sawflies, this group of insects, because they're ovipositors, thick and serrated usually, so that they can inject the eggs, basically saw eggs into the plant tissue. Um, now, some cont cultural control methods could be to pick newly emerged larvae off the plant or prune affected leaves. The larvae can't survive very well off the leaf. Um, and also use some foliar sprays like spinosad for young larvae. And before the season starts, before the actual hibiscus starts to f leaf out, um, using some systemic insecticides on the soil. Um, and they do have many generations per year. They can have up to about six per year, depending on uh, how, uh, how much your hibiscus is out. And uh, that can make them sometimes difficult to control. Now, there is a related looking one um, that feeds on hollyhock, the hollyhock sawfly. Uh, but these are very different as larvae. They have a red head instead of a black head and many more black nodules on the body. Uh, they also have much more extensive redness on the body of the adults. And the very interesting thing is that this group of sawflies, the argids, have only three antennal segments. So in this one, you can see there's one, two, and then a very long one. And in some of the groups, the males have this, what look like four antennae. And when I first saw it, I thought it was some new crazy type of insect. Uh, but it's just a soft light. And what happens here is that this last segment is a U-shaped segment and is connected at the bottom to make it look like two segments. The hibiscus soft light males will not have these type of antennae. They have the typical antennae that are straight and not U-shaped. Um, oh, by the way, I didn't mention these are not my photos. These are from Bug Guide. I didn't put the credits on them. I forgot to put the credits on them. But um, uh, all the rest of the ones where it shows are mine. OK, um, so let's go over this now. So these are saw, we just discussed a little bit about sawflies. They're wasps. Now, how do you distinguish between caterpillars and sawflies? The larvae of both are very distinct, are very, very similar looking. Uh, they're both, because they live in foliage, probably converge on a similar type of body shape and form. So how do you tell them apart? OK, well, these are some drawings of the two. And uh, basically, there are three main things to, to look for. Uh, the first, actually, the first two are going to be on the pro legs. So caterpillars will at most have five pro legs, these false fleshy legs that are on the abdomen. Uh, sawflies are usually going to have six or more pro legs on the abdomen. Uh, also, sawflies never have the crochets, which are these little hooks 
that, ha that exist on the prolegs of many caterpillars. Um, and while caterpillars would usually have crochets. Now I put an asterisk there because there's a few, very few caterpillars that have no legs, or there's some that have no legs, and very few that have more than five. It's very rare that you're going to find one that has more than five. And also there are a few sawflies that are slug-like and have reduced pro legs. But the next character, the next uh, identifier will actually help even more, and that's to look at the head. And caterpillars will have six simple eyes on each side of the head, whereas uh, sawflies will only have one, basically. And these are called stemata in the plural and stema in the singular. So if you ever see that in a book, uh, some people call them the ocellus, like in insects on the top of their head, the simple eyes. But anyway, caterpillars will usually have at least six, or will have six, uh, whereas sawflies will have one. Oftentimes also caterpillars will have uh, CD all over the body, but sawflies will sometimes have projections that look like CD. Okay, so time for quizzes. Okay, using your check mark or X mark, is this a sawfly, yes or no? Wow, fairly overwhelming. You guys sure you're right? I don't know. Okay. Well, okay. I think we have a consensus. This is, in fact, a sawfly. You can see the one simple eye on the side. Um, You've got these, these are the real true legs on the thorax, and then you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They have many, many pro legs, many more than a caterpillar. Okay, next one. Is this a sawfly, yes or no? Yeah. These are too easy. Okay. Okay, no, this is not a sawfly. This is a typical caterpillar. Um, you've got the five pro legs, one, two, three, four, and five on the end. And lots of CD, and you can tell it's very t it's a little tough to see, but they're going to have many stomata here and not just one big eye spot. Okay, last ones. Let's clear this. Sawflies or caterpillars? Okay, you guys are really good at this. All right, these are sawflies. This so this image shows some interesting things. So first. If we look at them, they have many more pro legs than five pro legs. But you can still see the caterpillar like look of them. Um, now, oftentimes, sawflies will congregate or live in groups, and they put on these basically these displays where they raise their body or they'll raise their head sometimes, and sometimes even they'll exude a really noxious fluid out of their mouth. This is to protect them from predators uh, while they're out exposed on the leaves. Um, so hopefully that helps you a little bit out in the field if you're wondering whether you're having sawfly or caterpillar damage happening. Okay. So uh, are there any questions so far? Okay. Well, we'll keep moving then, and uh, any questions can be saved till the end. So we have a question, does BT work on them? I am not sure exactly. Um, I can, we'll look that up, uh, but I would imagine it may, uh, but I'm not sure on that right now. Um, I'd have to talk to somebody or look up some information about them. 
Uh, and of course, there's different types of uh, sawflies uh, out there. And also, what are sawfly predators? Well, um, be, it would be some generalist predators would, would probably attack sawflies. But like I said, many of them either are covered in some noxious stuff or exude noxious stuff in their mouth parts uh, from their mouths. And so they may have some defenses against predators. Uh, but they are parasitized by other insects and are eaten by generalist predators, probably. Um, things like predatory stink bugs, uh, some predator, predatory bugs. Will systemics work for dusky birch sawfly? Uh, that I'm not sure of as, as well. Um, I'd have to look that up or uh, refer to one of the specialists. But that does uh, bring up a point that there are many different sawflies on many different types of plants. Um, and almost all sawflies are herbivorous. And so that's, again, why they look, look like caterpillars. OK. Well, the next thing is uh, kind of a sad news for North Carolina. Uh, we finally got the emerald ash borer. Uh, so uh, this is a beetle that is in the family of Bupressidae, the jewel beetles. And it's a member of the, spe of the genus Agrillus, which is one of the biggest genera, um, which is one of the biggest genera of uh, insects and, and animals in the world, over, over 2,500 species in the world. Uh, this beetle was inv is an invasive species originally from East Asia, uh, so China, Japan, Korea. And it attacks only ash trees, Fraxina species. Uh, the larvae burrow under the bark and kill the tree. And they will attack live trees. And they are e highly destructive to even healthy trees. Um, and I have a couple links at the bottom of this that we can, uh, I, I'll, I'll put in the, uh, in the uh, chat bar after I'm done. And uh, these are just some PDFs and blogs of the recent uh, finding of them. Now, um, to scout for emerald ash borer, you uh, basically look for some of the characteristic diagnostic marks. Uh, under the bark, under the bark, you have these serpentine back and forth feeding marks uh, with frass, sawdust filled in. Uh, the larvae that are in there under the bark are going to have this characteristic elongate shape. Uh, they're flattened. And highly characteristic of the species is that mature larvae are about an inch long and have these bell-shaped segments on the body, these bell-shaped abdominal segments. Also, like other agrillus, they're going to have two long, hardened prongs at the tail end. And uh, this is one of the ways you can identify them. Uh, when they're done feeding, they emerge from trees in a D-shaped exit hole. This is characteristic of bupressids, but if it's on uh, ash, uh, then it could very well be emerald ash borer. Now previously, uh, the emerald ash borer was first uh, intercepted in Michigan and Ontario uh, in early 2000s, uh, and has since been found in many of the northeastern states including Virginia. And so it was kind of inevitable that it was going to be found here. And just last week, uh, they found it in Granville County. And there are now quarantines for Granville person in Vance counties. Uh, so actually, I have a quick, quick question. Um, how, if, if you could, by putting a mark on where you are, how many of you have seen ash trees where you are? or know of ash trees in your area. Because that could show uh, the distribution or the, or the potential range or, or distance that they could go. OK. So central. We had a couple in southern. So fortunately for us, ash is more of a northern uh, tree, uh, but any of the ash that's present in North Carolina is now susceptible 
to Emerald Ash Borers. Um, so basically, the only uh, control measures right now are monitoring trees and destroying trees that are infected or as far as are infested by these beetles. Um, there's a possibility to look out for them and uh, do some treatments, but they uh, persist for a while and there's no guarantee that they won't be re, um, re infested and so it can become a laborious and time consuming thing to treat for these trees treat these trees. Uh, question is Ash the only host? Yes, Ash is the only host. Uh, but I think all species of ash are are host to it. So that's one of the best ways to identify it. If you see a long serpentine winding uh, under the bark, if the bark splits because of their activity and it's an ash tree, it's very likely that you have emerald ash borer. And the, the samples and specimens and things should be, uh, you should make uh, your, um, everybody know, know that this is happening in your area because it is an important pest and very destructive because especially it's attacking live trees. Okay. Um, any other questions about the emerald ash borer? There's lots and lots of information online about it. It and the Asian longhorn beetle are two very uh, important beetle pests in the U.S., especially for the uh, forestry industry and for, for uh, trees. So um, you can find lots and lots of information online uh, about them if you have any questions later. Okay. Um, so what I want to do kind of every time is actually also have a beneficial spotlight. So not just talking about the insects that will and other arthropods that will damage your plants, but some things that will actually help your garden. Uh, and today I want to spotlight one of my favorite insects here in North Carolina. This is the Carolina leaf rolling cricket, uh, Camptonotus carolinensis. This is the only member of the species in the family uh, Grillacridity in the entire U.S. Uh, and it's named after Carolina, so that's great. Uh, they are wingless crickets with extremely long antennae. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, females have a long sword-like ovipositor like katydids and crickets. Um, and one of the really interesting things about this species is that it produces silk from its mouth. And uh, that most of you didn't think of crickets as producing silk, but they do. Uh, some of them, and uh, what they do is they use the silk to roll leaves and make hideouts during the day. And at night is actually when they're doing their most activity, and this is when they're helping your garden because they're predators and mostly of aphids uh, and other soft-bodied insects on plants. So they basically go around and graze plants uh, and uh, feed on these little small, soft-bodied, tasty insects. So here's one I took up in uh, Durham, a photo of one at night, and uh, you can see the long antennae. But if you really want to see, here's the, here's the antennae. The antennae go off the page, basically, and extremely elongate. This is a male, but all these pictures were of males. You can see they don't have the really long, uh, female would have a long sword-like ovipositor coming off the ta tail end. Um, and here's a picture of, uh, from Flickr of one of their little hideouts. And you can see the silk right there that they produced. And this is where they hide during the day. So if you find a little kind of nest uh, rolled up of leaves, it may be something else, but it could also be a Carolina leaf rolling cricket. So you can peek in there, see if you see one, and then, you know, be happy that you have them eating aphids in your garden. They also are attracted to lights, and sometimes you can find them on the sides of houses, things like that. Okay, and uh, now to wrap up with a couple of things. Things to look out for. Um, the past couple of weeks, I've been getting a lot of calls and uh, clinic photos and, and emails about worm-like things that are coming out af on all over their people's houses, on their porch, inside their houses sometimes. Uh, and they all turn out to be this, this thing, this creature, the greenhouse millipede. 
uh, very common organism around homes, usually in the soil, usually uh, you can find them in gardens, under rocks, things like that. But the problem is that lately with all the rain we've been having, it's been driving these millipedes out of the soil and onto homes and onto structures uh, so they can dry out because they do like moisture, but too much moisture uh, is bad for them. And so this can actually happen with several organisms where if you have lots of rains, ants are one of them, uh, they'll start coming into houses more or coming onto houses more because they can't survive in a very wet environment. Um, so be on the lookout for them. To control them, the easiest thing to do is just to vacuum or sweep them up. Or if you can stand it, just wait until the rains subside and it starts to dry out. And then they'll go back in the soil and you won't see them. They also can't survive very long in homes because it's too dry. So if they come in your home, again, you can vacuum them up. Uh, they do have a distinct odor, as many millipedes do. Um, and so they kind of smell a little bit. But other than that, they are not harmful. They do not bite. Or very rarely do they damage plants, only in high numbers. Uh, will they sometimes eat plant roots? Mostly they're eating organic material in the garden soil. Uh, and they are close relatives of uh, centipedes, which are much faster and predatory. OK, uh, the other thing, we got an interesting sample into, uh, into the clinic from the NC Zoo uh, from one of their bird exhibits. They had ficus plants uh, that had these strange spots all over them. Um, and when I got it in, in the bag, there were several orange larvae. And I looked at these spots and looked up the host and found out that there's actually a gall us uh, whoops. This says gall wasps. This should say gall midges, because this is a type of fly. Um, and uh, basically, these flies lay their eggs in the tissue of the leaf. And uh, at first, it's a greenish blister. And then as it gets older, and as they're about to leave, these turn into blackish brown lesions, similar to bacterial or fungal leaf spots. So they can be misidentified, perhaps. Uh, but if you look for, on the upper surface, you're going to find little exit holes from where the larvae left the leaf. Um, and these affect. Apparently, the original publication for the species, uh, the host was Ficus benjamina. Uh, but in the US now, and in Florida, they first uh, uh, intercepted it in Naples, where there's lots of Ficus microcarpa, Indian laurel fig, uh, lots of hedges of them. They're being affected the most here in the US. And so that was this one in the zoo. This one was affected uh, very badly. Um, and as of yet, we don't have any good control measures. It's a fairly new pest. Um, I would say pruning the affected areas is going to help a lot, um, and making sure to isolate the plant from soil, places where the larvae would pupate and become adults and go and lay eggs. Um, they will affect uh, the ficus benjamina is the typical household fig, but I'm not sure how much they affect them in the US right now. Uh, but as far as Indian laurel fig, these are susceptible to this, this uh, gall midge. Um, and lastly, a couple of caterpillars looking out for uh, black swallowtails on parsley and dill. This is the time of year when those plants are becoming much, much larger and able to uh, support large larvae. Uh, and also tomatoes with hornworms. Everybody's favorite, very common groups of caterpillars uh, on tomatoes. And um, you can either pick these things off uh, as cultural control. If you have a large amount of them, so there are several sprays out there uh, for them. Um, but also, you could wait until some of the larger tobacco hornworms and such get par parasitized by braconid wasps. And when the Burkana wasps are done feeding on the larvae, they exit out and make these cocoons. I'm sure many of you have seen these. Uh, these are actually the cocoons of the wasp. And uh, what you see here is one of the larvae spinning the cocoons after it has exited the caterpillar. So uh, that's it for me today. Um, are there any questions? I will try and find out more information about the sawflies and control for them. Um, and uh, if 
you have any questions, let me know. Thanks, Matt. Next up on the schedule is Mike Munster with diseases. Welcome, Mike. Oh, thanks, Lucy. Uh, was Mark back on? Did you want to go back and try showstoppers again? I'll give me a chance to upload my fuller presentation that I had cut short because of the the limit on the number of megabytes that were allowed in the <coughs> presentation. Uh, Mark, are you here? Yes, I am. Thanks well, so much. Let's flip back to showstoppers. Matt Bertone, everybody. <laughs> oh, all right. So, hey, thanks for having me today. I really appreciate that. I'd like to share some of my favorite loves today, and that is the Roman numeral six. The great state of Texas, my great friend Agnes, and oh, since I've never broken a leg, the cast. Oh, along with my favorite unknown place, Shoal Creek. All right, so that's my introduction for <laughs> Vitex Agnes Castus, <laughs> Shoal Creek. It's a Oh, okay, so <laughs> it's a great vigorous grower that establishes quickly and stops about 15 feet. It deals with most soil and landscape conditions, providing aromatic foliage, violet flowers, and fun visitors like hummingbirds and butterflies. Chase Tree can provide some great structure to your garden with its multiple trunks that are beautifully bare in the winter. Roar! Get it? Bare. Okay, <laughs> so Vitex Agnes, Agnes Cast with Shoal Creek was picked as a 2013 showstopper plant by Extension Agents and the North Carolina Landscape and Nursery Association members because it can go great in just about any Carolina landscape. Check out the 2013 list and other great resources at the Extension Gardener page. Thanks a lot, everybody. Back to Lucy. Mark, thanks so much for making it fun. Um, we're going to skip back down to Mike. And I'm not sure whether Mike was able to get all of his slides loaded. We, we had so many images for you today, we maxed out the capacity of the program. So, Mike, are you here? I am, but I can't talk. Okay. Well, if you want another minute, Dan asked a question that didn't get answered um, when Matt was up. Matt, can you um, tell us about any new word on ground pearls? Um, yeah, I saw the uh, I saw that question there. Um, as far as I know, there's nothing new about them. Uh, they uh, they are still very difficult to control, um, and uh, I've talked to Peter Hurdle here, who studies ground pearls and in great detail, and uh, from what he said, there's nothing, there's no new controls for them. Um, so unfortunately, that's, uh, that's, I wish I had a better answer. All right, to give um, Mike another minute to, to see if we can, can get the sound and the pictures working together, let me just run through the announcements really quickly. We have a number of different ways to stay in touch. We have an email list for Extension Master Gardener volunteers. We'd love to have uh, you join that. There's a <coughs> new website for North Carolina Extension Master Gardener volunteers. And we have an intranet that is a password protected area for Extension Master Gardener volunteers. So check out all of these sites and also the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Association and this, and this is their website. I just want to do a quick thank you to Jeff Reeves, who's finishing out on July 31st. He's been an outstanding agent in um, Union County, and I think he does two counties, but anyway, Union County for sure. And Jeff was our host for the 
Extension Semester Gardener Conference this, this summer and really, really appreciate all that he did for that and for, for all that he's done as a part of Extension. Wishing him all the best as he moves forward to new adventures. Here's some things to um, look for. These are upcoming events. We have three places that you can go for calendar information about upcoming regular gardening events are at the first one. The community gardening events are at the second one. And the master gardener events are, are located at these places. Coming up in July is the Culloway Native Plant Conference. Outstanding program every year. And this year they've got Doug Calamy, who's bringing nature home, uh, the entomologist. Uh, as well as Dick Bird, Denny Werner, and lots of other great speakers are going to be a part of that. Strongly encourage you to go if you're able to attend that. The next uh, Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Association quarterly meeting will be in Raleigh. I um, hope that those of you who are a part of the association leadership will plan to be there, and everyone is welcome. Uh, the North Carolina Horticulture Therapy group is having their third conference. So it will be August 16th through 17th at Pinehurst. So let me know if you want more information about that, and I can put you in touch with the folks who are hosting that. And most importantly, our next Plants, Pests, and Pathogens is going to be on August 27th. So put that on your schedule. And looking forward to seeing many of you at the International Master Gardener Conference, which is going to be in Alaska this summer. OK, let's sit back to Mike. Mike, can you can you talk now? I can talk. Can everybody hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. <laughs> Let me. Um, I do want to not zip past a question that came in from David Green in Buncombe County, but that would not be for me. That would be for someone else. Um, Mark, I don't know if you have information about the invasive potential for Vitex. And I'm not sure if Mark is still with us to, to answer that. Debbie, let me see what I can get back to you on that. All right, well then let me take it from here. But I do want to make sure, since I noticed that on some of the questions there were only about half as many responses one way or the other as there were participants. And just in case the reason was that folks weren't quite comfortable yet with the interface, I wanted to point out that we've got some tools. For example, the yes, no box is located under your name on the participant list, which now that we can move the windows around on the screen, it may not be in the same place for everyone, but the participants' window on my screen is roughly across about from halfway to the edge of that hand that I just put over to the edge of the screen. So if you can see that, go ahead and bring down a green check so that I know that everyone's seeing it. and. Like the like the guy who said, everyone who can't hear me, raise your hand. I won't ask you to check an X if you don't see it. OK, so I see a few people, just a handful who haven't found it. OK, but most people have found that. OK, Barbara, I think you went just a little too far and hit the raise your hand for a question. Or did you have a question, Barbara? Okay. The uh, I know. Okay. The other place to look is um, well that same on that same box when the question becomes a multiple choice that will change to A, B, C, or D, and in the same way you use that to write your or select your answer. And I think everyone knows where the the chat box is now, so that. We can, if there's a free form question, you can enter your response there. All right, with no further ado, let me move on to this week's forecast from the National Weather Service. This is the graphic that I downloaded from weather.gov at 8.20 this morning. And it's a pretty rainy forecast, at least a 40 to 60% chance of thunderstorms through uh, the weekend. I believe it even goes beyond Saturday, the, the chance of rain. And that being the case, 
and with being six inches ahead of normal precipitation for the year here in Raleigh, I think it's time for the captain to turn on the fasten seat belt sign and prepare ourselves for a lot of fungal and bacterial diseases in the garden and in the field. I will be talking about some of these that we'll be seeing and have to be on the lookout for that have quite a bit of destructive potential as the talk moves along. First of all, though, one that's fairly simple and um, not really doing anything more than cosmetic damage, but let's change the tool to the change the polling to an A, B, C, D, E. Got it? So now that same spot where you were checking your yes and no, you'll have a chance to answer A, B, C, D, or E for this question as to what is causing these spots on the red bud leaf. And don't be afraid to venture a guess even if you're not sure. This picture was taken just a few yards outside the, the clinic here. But it's something that we will see all the way up until the end of the summer, until the leaves drop in the fall. These small spots, very well defined, with little yellow halos on them. All right, give folks just a few more seconds there. All right, it looks like we've got uh, the majority who answered did answer correctly. Yes, this is a fungus. This leaf spot is caused by Passolora circidicola, which some of you may know by its older name of Circospora circidicola. And it's a number of one of a number of different fungi in this group, the Circosporoid or Circospora like fungi that do cause leaf spots on trees and on peanuts and on other different kinds of plants. Very often, and this is not exclusive to these fungi, but very often with the yellow halos that you see in this particular picture. Now, the naming can be tricky of these fungi and as the one fungus, one name rule starts to trickle down to a practical level, we'll be seeing how it's all going to going to shake out. So don't get too attached to any particular name at this point, because I'm not sure what the final name that things are going to be called once the rule gets completely implemented. But going back to the spots here, as it turns out, many, probably most of our leaf spots on trees are caused by fungi. Now, I'm not talking about the larger blotches, which can sometimes be from problems lower down, either in the stem or in the roots or in the soil. But these very well-defined true leaf spots, in most cases, you'll be right if you guess that it's caused by a fungus. And in this particular case, it's something that's just causing some cosmetic damage. It's going to be a recurring aesthetic problem. It may be uh, worse on one tree than another. Uh, may vary from year to year, probably, with different weather conditions. But it's something that basically we should encourage people to live with and not try and overreact. If they want to clean up the leaves in the fall and make sure that there's not an overwintering of the spores and the dead leaves, that would be one action that they could take. Though here is a little bit different scenario with the sample that was sent in first as a digital image from Johnston County nearby and then since we couldn't tell exactly what it was based on the pictures alone, we asked for a physical sample. And this one turned out to be uh, a relative of the fungus you saw in the previous picture. Now notice again the halos around the spots on these mulberry leaves. And this one turns out to be a case where they had a recurring problem. Every year for the last three years, these spots had developed. They'd spread, get more serious on the tree, leaves would turn yellow and drop off so that by the fall, the tree had already defoliated. And it turns out that this was caused by a fungus called Mycosphorella. 
There are other names for this. You may have seen it called Solarium Dysporium as well, and then there are a couple other names. In this case, what we're going to want to do, I'm sorry, I didn't advance the slide here, is not worry about other shrubs because this is pretty much restricted to mulberry alone. And the fungus itself is going to be spread by splashing water and also by wind. The control is to remove fallen leaves again in the wintertime once they fall off so that it's not overwintering for the next year. Try and keep your leaf wetness down, maybe by pruning things, as Mark was talking about with the roses, to let some good air circulation come through. Don't run the sprinkler so that they're going to be spraying the foliage of the plant. And in this particular case, because it's been a recurring problem, because it's a small tree, you would probably have some benefit of using fungicides. Now, the important thing here is that we've got to remember that this is a mulberry. It's being grown for ornamental purposes. If it's one of those clones that does not produce fruits, then there's not a problem with using a fungicide that has just an ornamentals label. But if this thing produces fruit, even if it's not the intention of the homeowner to eat those fruit, because they don't know the intentions of the pastors by or people who come to visit them, they will have to use a fungicide that does have a homeowner label for use on edible crops. So possible choices in that case would be copper-containing fungicides or mancozeb. The important thing in those cases, though, is that they are not going to cure an infection that has already started. They've got to be on the surface of the leaf in place before the fungus infects in order to do any good. So a little bit of an unusual case. Unless you're some silkworm growers out there, it's probably not going to be something you'll run across. But I thought it was good to illustrate not only uh, fungal disease that's causing leaf spots, but also some of the decision-making process on whether or not fungicides are going to be economically justified in cases like this. Most times, leaf spots on trees, we just say, live with it, break up the leaves, and don't worry because it's not going to be causing long-term harm to the health of the plant. Right. I realized after this sample came in and decided to talk about it that we hadn't talked about corn on this program. At least I hadn't. And that's a serious omission. So we're going to correct that now, starting with this sample that came in from Wayne County earlier this month. So going back to your A, B, C, D, E, I'll clear the old responses. Oh, someone already did that, OK? Oh, no, they didn't. Let me clear those. All right. Now try again. If you've already done it, please try again. What is causing these blister-like growths on the leaves and leaf sheaths of this corn plant? I'll give you a hint. Maybe you would recognize it more easily if it were on a different part of the plant. That's maybe why it was sent in, because it was in a bit of an unusual location. While people are doing that, uh, I see there was a question from Venus about whether or not there's an effective treatment for azalea gall. I assume that you're talking about the leaf gall caused by the fungus exobacidium in that case. And while there are fungicides that could be used when you've got an extremely heavy uh, currents, you've got to get them at the right time because it's got an unusual life cycle and just hanging out in buds at this time of year and will really activate again when leaves start to emerge in the spring. But in general, the, really the treatment in those cases with azaleas and also with uh, camellia, which is where it's more often seen, is just to prune out those affected swollen leaves before the fungus has a chance to spoilate. All right, let's see what the polling shows here. All 
All right, those who chose to respond, it seems like it was a little bit across the board. At least no one went for violence. Virus, and it turns out that again, those who are in the picture that I took uh, when I lived in Mexico, maybe a little bit more familiar manifestation of this particular fungus, causing the ear to turn into eventually a mass of spores covered with a little bit of fungal tissue. The name of the fungus is Eustilago matis, and as you probably know, it's most common on ears, but you can also occasionally see it on tassels, leaves, and stalks. It's probably the most common smut that we would see on corn in our area. And the losses are usually minor, but you may get questions about it from homeowners, gardeners. And if they're interested in control, they can do a few things like removing debris at the end of the year from the garden, practicing rotation because uh, there is survival of the spores in the soil. Avoiding wounding of the plants, physical wounds, insect wounds, and hail even will uh, wounds will allow the fungus to enter. Although in a case like this on the ear, it's actually infecting through the silks, so not much you can do about that. But uh, really, the best thing to do is when they're young, before they've produced the massive spores inside, to harvest that and uh, maybe fry it up in a little butter and eat it because they are actually quite delicious. Back when I lived in Mexico, when we lived in Aguas Calientes, it was interesting that when these were in season, it was the most expensive item in the produce section of the supermarket. Oh, and uh, by the way, chemical control is not practical here if people are in the sort of control mentality on this particular disease. I had another sweet corn sample. This one came in from Sampson County, also earlier this month. And actually, in this case, this might have only come in as an image sample. I'm not sure. Let's go to a picture of the same problem, though, on sweet corn from Moore County a couple of years ago in May of 2010. And here's a case where I'm going to put a little bit of the description of it in to see if you can recognize what this might be. Sweet corn field has an unusual stalk rot occurring. Plants are rotting off somewhere between 5 and 12 inches above the ground. No insects found and no signs of insect feeding. Rot has a distinct smell of soured grain or mash. Plants are green and healthy prior to falling over and 3 to 5 inch section of stalk rotting. So I don't have an ABCD on this, but if anyone knows what this is, you are welcome to either put it in the chat box or use the little text box and type it and stick it on the, the whiteboard there. For those of you who don't know where that is, at least on my screen, it's located right about there, that text box. All right, two brave souls have ventured their guesses. Anybody else? And by the way, I don't think this is just in the Santos. We had a suspect case from Ash County a couple of years ago. Another little tidbit is that this is often happens at the at the height of the same level as the ear on the stalk. All right. Well, Sean and uh, Timothy, you have it. This is bacterial stalk rot of corn. The bacterium that causes it, many of you are familiar with it under the name of Erwinia, Erwinia chrysanthemi, now known as Dickia chrysanthemi, but there are other bacterial species that can do this. And it produces a soft, wet rot with a strong, fishy odor, which is different from Pythium stalk rot, which would not have the odor associated with it. The bacteria enter through wounds and through natural openings in the plant. And this is a, an interesting case because in most occurrences, it's associated with corn that has been overhead irrigated from a pond or other stagnant water source. Although it 
is possibly associated also with heavy rain. So uh, another reason to alert you to it for this year. The thing that you want to do, of course, in this case would be avoiding any kind of wounding of the plants as usual. And if possible, don't use overhead irrigation on corn, especially sweet corn from ponds, lakes, or slow moving streams. All right, here's another corn case. This isn't from this time of year, but it's something that can occur really throughout the growing season. So I'm going to leave it in and see if you can figure it out. Home garden with several 100 foot rows of sweet corn. Plants in the middle of the rows are showing classic phosphorus deficiency symptoms, yet soil test results show pH is 6.3 and phosphorus index is over 400. That's, that's pretty high. Roots appear healthy. Affected plants are stunted, exhibit red foliage, growing in sandy loam soil. Plants on both ends of the rows are growing normally. What does this sound like? Again, you can either use the chat box or type in a text box and plaster it on the whiteboard there. All right, Sean suggests nematode injury. Phosphorus toxicity, someone else suggests Charlie. All right, a biota problem of some sort. OK, that could be. In that case, though, you would want to know why it was happening in the middle of the rows and not on the ends. That's a clue right there. If it's something that's patchy, just occurring in, in certain areas of the field, then you're going to think something in the soil. And in fact, showing you two for two, this turned out to be, at least uh, this is diagnosed based on photos, but it was suspected of being either a stubby root or a sting nematode that was causing this. So you got basic phosphorus deficiency type symptoms because the root system was compromised. Now I had a whole spiel worked up for talking about nematodes, but because of the seriousness of some of the fungal problems that we're going to be expecting, I decided to cut that out. And we'll hopefully be able to talk about nematodes a little bit more in our next program or maybe in the last program of the year. One of these things that we really have to now be aware of, and I think I mentioned this is something to look out for when we had our last program, but now it's here. This was in Nash County on June 5th. It was the second detection of this disease in North Carolina for the year. The first detection had been the day before in Wayne County. And it is cucurbit downy mildew. Notice that small, or they start out small, angular, somewhat yellowish, then dying leaf spots on the underside of the leaf surface. If the humidity has been high, you'll see a bit of a grayish or a bluish gray color, which is the spoilation of the fungus. Or if you want to be a, a real uh, stickler, the fungus-like organism that causes this, which is called Pseudoparanospora cubensis. The conducive weather, the warm, wet weather that we had early last week means that we are probably right about now going to be seeing a big spike in the cucurbit downy mildew. So it's a good time to have everyone aware and looking for it. This is just the beginning, and uh, it could lead to tremendous damage on susceptible and untreated cucurbits. Here is, just so you see a little bit of the variation in what it looks like. Here is a picture from Bugwood of what it can do on melon. This is uh, very typical of what it can do on that particular host. So you see the blotches are a little bit bigger. They do have that yellow around them still. Here's a sample from also from Bugwood of a pumpkin field with severe damage. And it can even get on watermelon. Now, so far in North Carolina, 
it has been, at least the clinic has only found it or reported it on cucumber, but I understand that it has also been found on cantaloupe and possibly squash. So you need to be looking for it on all of the cucurbits. So as far as your home garden clientele, what can they do to manage cucumber, or I'm sorry, cucurbit downy mildew in the garden? Well, one would be taking off on Mark Wyndham's really interesting graphic there with dew and gutation causing leaf wetness during the night. So we want to avoid, if possible, extending that wet period of the leaves avoiding late day watering and avoiding overhead irrigation if possible. Unfortunately, fungicides are only going to be of limited effectiveness, especially the fungicides that are available to the home grower, the best of which is going to be chlorothalonil or products based on chlorothalonil, which there are. And if they're an organic producer, there are some copper products that can be used, but that is uh, again, going to have limited effectiveness in controlling, controlling this disease, especially if the conditions are favorable as they have been. If you've got it, if you've got heavy leaf loss, then your best strategy is just to harvest the fruit that you have so that you can avoid sunburn, which will occur when the, when the leaves are gone. Next year, if you plant it late, planting early can help because this is something that doesn't actually overwinter in North Carolina. It overwinters in more southerly places and uh, blows in on air currents or is brought in sometimes on transplants. So an early planted cucumber crop can escape damage. And down the line, resistant varieties will be a thing to look at. There, I was looking on the um, websites of some of the seed companies. Burpee has one melon and two cucumber varieties that uh, they say are resisted, and Park has one cucumber line. And it's interesting, this we usually and often preach rotation, but there's a case where rotation of crops is completely irrelevant because these are these epidemics are started by spores that belong in, blow, are blown in from long distances away. All right. If you would, everyone, get out now a piece of paper and number it from 1 to 6, because it's time for our quiz on things to watch for in July and August. Our first slide will be of this Indian hawthorn. So just jot down there what you think the disease is. Don't type anything in the chat box at this point. Just put it on your paper, and then we're going to go through all six again at the end. All right, example number two. What is happening to these peaches? Number three, what's happening to these peaches? Number four, what's happening at the base of this oak tree? Number five, what's happening to this oak leaf? And number six, what's happening to the foliage and fruit of this tomato?
All right, let's check our answers. Number one is Entomosporium leaf spot, which you'll see on photinias, if there are any photinias left in the landscape, and also on Indian hawthorn. It's not a disease that likes it particularly hot. It's active more in the cooler months, but you will see a damage. Of course, the uh, best thing to do here is change your variety that you're using because there are some that are much less susceptible. Number two, brown rot of not just peach but other stone fruits. So make sure your fruit growers are on a good spray program and make sure and harvest those things way before you see in these pictures. Get them off the tree so it doesn't spread. Number three is peach scab caused by a fungus, a cladosporium species, although bacterial spot, if you put that, uh, we can't really mark you too wrong because it does or can look quite similar. Number four was slime flux, a little bit unusual in that we don't often see that kind of foamy. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen in person that foamy look to slime flux, although alcoholic flux can, can do that. And um, of course, you can't smell it here, but you would smell the typical fermented odor, and it would often attract insects. So those are big clues. We most often see this on white oak, but it can happen on really any hardwood tree. Not always near the ground, sometimes a little bit higher up, such as on uh, elms, you might see it higher up. Here's a picture of what was probably slime flux earlier in the year, but what it looked like in December after it had dried, and you just saw the staining. This was bacterial leaf scorch caused by Xylella fastidiosa, and we'll start seeing the unusually early, what looks almost like fall coloration coming in, and that's our sign that our pin oaks, especially our sycamores and some other things are, are getting bacterial leaf scorch, and there is no treatment for that. And worst of all, late blight, Phytophthora infestans. As of, well, as you know, this is a disease, quite destructive disease, both of tomato and of potato. And as of last Thursday, it was found in eastern Virginia on potatoes. I'm not aware of any reports yet confirmed, physically confirmed, although there was suspicion based on a picture in North Carolina potatoes or tomatoes. But it's something that's going to be knocking at the door, especially with this white, uh, this uh, wet weather. A few things about late blight. Commercial folks know what to do. For home gardeners uh, in the mountains, talking about on tomato now, you need to be protecting with chlorothalonil, such as daconil or uh, other products with chlorothalonil, or with copper-based products. These are going to only be limited in their effectiveness, but that's really the best that's available for the home garden. Once the disease is established, your best strategy is just going to be to harvest what there's there and uh, destroy the vines. There may be some resistance out there. I've only seen it in a, in a few lines, but if you look on the alert that Kelly Ivers put out, and I'll show you a way to get there in a moment, you can see some information about some of the different kinds of tomatoes that will have some resistance to this disease. And again, potato can also get it, and control measures are similar. Please do, though, if you think you've got it, since we don't have an official confirmation from a physical sample this year for the state, to uh, do send us a sample. All right, I learned a new word on the radio this morning from the whole IRS scandal, the Be On The Lookout list. So the Be On The Lookout list for July and August as far as diseases includes, of course, Phytophthora powdery mildew on many things, root knot nematodes, and dog vomit slime mold in mulch, woody ornamentals, the usual shot hole on prunus, heat and drought stress, which can look somewhat like that bacterial leaf scorch I showed you a minute ago, poor planting techniques, things that have been planted too deeply, or you know, the hole not dug properly, planting stress from planting at the wrong time of year, all these kind of things will start to show once the weather especially turns hot and rose rosette, as Mark talked about. In flower beds, the root and stem rots, Pythium rhizoctonium, especially Scrolstrum rolfsii, which can be in the vegetable garden also, and miscellaneous leaf spots. Mummyberry of blueberry, it's been there. The infections occurred quite a while ago. 
but you'll start to see it now. The fruit, instead of maturing, turn start to shrivel up and, and turn into the, the little mummy. And fruit rots on apple, grape, and, and other fruit trees. The vegetable garden will have to contend with tomato spotted wilt virus, septoria leaf spot on tomato, bacteria leaf spot on tomato and pepper, southern bacterial wilt, and of course herbicide injury from drifts from either glyphosate or the uh, synthetic auxin type herbicides. In turf, three of the big ones are going to be brown patch, pythium blight, and leaf spot on Bermuda grass. I see there was a question, is there any treatment for slime flux? No, there is no treatment. Uh, at one time, it was recommended to stick a pipe in there so that the flux would drain away from the cambium and not, um, and not damage that. But really, the thing to do is just leave it alone. It may flux this year and never again, or it may flux a couple years in a row. It's just going to vary. I do want to mention, I know this is uh, still got the final finishing touches being put on it, but there's just too much good information on the plant pathology portal, not to mention it, especially as we have these rapidly developing disease situations. I'm typing the link into the chat box there so that you can click on that and keep up on uh, different alerts. Of course, uh, the clinic, we have our own website as well, and you can be sure and follow things on our blog and, and Twitter feeds and Facebook. All right, I plowed right up to the fence row again this week. It's 12.02, so back to you, Lucy. Thanks, Mike. Mike's questions? So I, think, I think I'll leave it there. Any questions or comments that anybody wants to share with the group before we adjourn? All right, many thanks to, to all of the presenters and to each of you for, for joining us. Um, we'll see you August 27th. <laughs>